Hello, friends. It's Mike Williams. I recently had the pleasure of joining Mark Devlin on his podcast to discuss the Beatles conspiracy. I hope you enjoy the show, and thanks for listening. So I get into many different subject areas on these shows, as listeners will be aware, but I always like it when the discussion circle back round to the music industry. That is the core basis of my work. And my guest today is a guy I've had on previously. I just checked when he was last on. It was actually April 2019. So we're kind of due another discussion. So welcome back to an exceptional researcher and speaker, Mike Williams, aka Sage of Quay. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for asking me to come back on your show. No worries. So I do a bit later want to get into the question of celebrities and public figures in general and what they're really used for, what their agendas might be. But the bulk of this discussion is going to be about the Beatles. You've done a tremendous amount of research into this group. I've done a fair bit myself, but it pales compared to the amount of hours that you've put in. And I guess we're not going to be able to avoid talking about the Paul McCartney situation the McCartney replacement along the way. So to start off with, I just want to reference an amazing piece of work you put out in, I think it was April 2020, well, April Fool's Day, actually. Your four and a half hour presentation asking the question, did the Beatles write their own music? And during this video, which many uh, viewers will have seen, and if they haven't, they should certainly head across there. You presented all the evidence to show that during a certain period in 1965, around the time of the Rubber Soul album, it was physically impossible for Lennon and McCartney to have written all the songs that they're credited with, given all the other things that are on the public record that the Beatles had on their schedule at that time. So, if that applies to one small period in 1965, a logical, critical mind would have to conclude that it probably applied to other periods in their career and maybe their whole career. So I think that's a very key piece of work. It tells us a lot about the true nature of the Beatles, and it really reinforces this overriding notion that that group were a construct, a social engineering, psyop, coming out of Tavistock, which I would certainly agree with. So it's an amazing piece of work. Do you just want to talk a bit more about what it does tell us there? Yeah, so it took me a while, Mark, to, to put that presentation together. And the reason why I did do it was because I was watching a documentary titled Deconstructing Rubber Soul. It's a series of uh, DVDs that talk about the different Beatle albums. And for some reason, I chose to look at Rubber Soul first. And being a musician, a songwriter, and recording songs myself, being in and out of studios, especially earlier on in my life, I know something about the process. And so I got about 20 minutes into the DVD, and the setup was that the Beatles came in with essentially no backlog of music. They were writing from scratch, so they had to write, rehearse, arrange, record, and mix 16 new songs in 30 days. So 14 songs were on the Rubber Soul album, and then there was a double A-side single, Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out, I think it was. So right off the bat, I said, this is not possible. It's not possible to do 16 songs in 30 days, writing from scratch. And um, so I kept looking into it and looking into it, digging in, digging into it more and more. And uh, another aspect of it was that a lot of people think that the only thing that has to get done when you make an album is to just record the album, record the songs. But there's the whole process of, uh, of the artwork, the album sleeves. Uh, it's knowing the uh, the sequencing of the songs, the time of the songs, uh, the names of the songs, getting the, the record labels, the round uh, labels in the middle of the 33 RPM records or the 45s, getting those printed. All of that work has to get done. And so I had a person uh, that was uh, connected into the research at the time who was very, very familiar with the, the music industry and the process of recording, going back to the days of vinyl. Um, and uh, we concluded that 
that whole process, 30 days, and then having the album out on December 3rd. So the Beatles left the recording studio. They came in on October 11th of 65. They left on November 11th of 1965. They finished up, I should say, on November 11th, into the wee hours of the morning. And then they, then George Martin had the, the songs mixed, but the lacquer wasn't cut until November 17th. So the lacquer, you have to have a final lacquer before you can make an album. So the, the number of days or the time couldn't really start as far as all this other stuff I just talked about, creating the album sleeves and all that. Uh, couldn't start until August, excuse me, August, November 17th. And so the Beatles really wrapped up Rubber Soul as final, as far as a final lacquer goes, starting on November 17th of 1965. And then the album was in stores, in retail, December 3rd. So we're talking about what, you know, two weeks, two and a half weeks. So the cycle time involved in the entire process, not just of the making of the album, writing the music and recording it, mixing it and all that stuff, but all everything else that goes along with it, packaging the album, the album sleeves and all that, and distribution couldn't possibly have happened. So the question becomes, so how did this work? How were they able to get that album into stores on December 3rd? And so the only way it could have happened to make a long story very short is much of the process had to start much earlier than when the Beatles arrived in the studio at EMI on October 11th of 1965. So I concluded that um, all of the songs were written. They were already recorded by the time the Beatles got into the studio on October 11th. So they were written by ghost writers. They, the songs were recorded by studio players. George Martin managed the entire process from the very beginning, from starting in 1962. And when the Beatles got into the studio, oh, and before I get to before I get to the Beatles getting into the studio on October 11th, the whole process of getting the album sleeves created, the artwork and all of that, that was already underway. So they, since they already had the, the names of the songs because they were already written, George Martin already had the run times of the songs. So therefore, he can do the sequencing. In other words, what order did the songs appear on side A or side B of the vinyl? So all of that was done. So by the time the Beatles got into the studio on October 11th, the record sleeves, the artwork, and all of that stuff was essentially either done or near completion and waiting for the, the vinyl to be cut so that they can slip them into the sleeves and package them and distribute them and get them into the stores by December 3rd. So all of this work was done beforehand. The Beatles came into the studio to do one thing, and that was to sing, to do the vocals. So I concluded that what they did between October 11th and November 11th, that 30 day period of time was to do the vocals. That's what they did for Rubber Soul. And so when you go back in time, you take a look at some of their, their other albums as an example going back to please please me we're told that they recorded 10 songs in one day um i, I could tell you right now uh, they did not do that okay there's a lot of these fantastical types of stories that are put out there and we're told that only the beatles can do this because well because they're the beatles and then with with the beatles we're told that they recorded 14 songs in seven days, which weren't contiguous. In other words, they, they did, maybe they went into the studio for a couple of days, two or three days, and then they took a break or they were doing something else. And then they went back into the studio. But when you add the non-contiguous days up at seven, that they recorded 14 songs. And we're told, as you probably know, when they went to India, they wrote 30 plus songs in India leading up to the, uh, the White Album sessions were told that they uh, they recorded 27 demos in one day, an unknown day, by the way. I could not find a date for when this, this feat was performed. 27 songs, demos were recorded in an unknown day in May of 1968, again, leading into the White Album sessions. And um, 
So when you know when you take a look at all of these stories, like I said, they're fantastical. And you, you get to a point where, especially after I looked at Rubber Soul, I said, well, you know what? This stuff, this stuff doesn't make any sense. I mean, this is stuff that uh it's not it's not believable. It's extremely far-fetched. But there was also an article that goes back to the August, September 1962 edition of the of Mercy Beat, which was a music publication back in the day. And it had an article on uh, Pete Best being replaced by Ringo Starr. And then the article goes on to say that the Beatles are flying to London to record songs that were written for them and given to them by their recording manager, their producer, George Martin. Didn't say they were recording songs that they wrote. It clearly says in black and white in a major publication at the time, especially if you were in the music scene back in the day, it said that they were going to the studio to write songs that were written for them, you know, and then maybe we'll get into let it be or the get back sessions, because that's another proof point in my mind that showed what the Beatles were not capable of. Peter Jackson in his documentary and then uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg back in the day, you know, they, they tried to, I think, especially Peter Jackson to paint a picture where, um, where, uh, the Let It Be sessions were much larger uh, as far as the Beatles being able to accomplish something than they really were. In other words, I, I, I come, my thought is that the Beatles did not do well during the Get Back, get back sessions. They originally came in to do uh, 14 new songs, write and record uh, in a little over two weeks. The two weeks came and by, it was total chaos. It wound up going 30 days and in that 30 day period of time, they performed five songs on a rooftop to no audience and ended up releasing a substandard album, especially by Beatles standards. And that was only done because they turned the tapes over to uh, at least the Let It Be album tapes to um, uh, Phil Spector. And Lennon at the time was quoted as saying that, and I have this in one of my presentations, John had said that uh, they handed over a pile of shit to paraphrase, to Phil Spector, and he did a great job with what he was given. So my point being is that even Let It Be, it, you know, the, the premise coming into the Get Back Sessions was another fantastical story. They were going to do 14 new songs in, in, in uh, two weeks. They were going to do two concerts uh, for a TV special, and none of that stuff materialized, none of it. And I argued, uh, I did a whole sequence of of shows on Get Back that I don't even believe they wrote those songs on the spot. I believe that uh, they had come in with certain songs. In other words, they were pre-written before the uh, the recording of the Get Back sessions, but it was played up um, that they were actually written during the sessions. I don't think that that's the case. Right. In any case, but so kind of long-winded, but that's what happened. Uh, it all started with looking at Rubber Soul. Sure. There's been a lot of reinforcement of the official Beatles narrative in recent times, which mm -hmm. smacks of damage limitation, in my view. It's almost as if the likes of you and me and many other researchers out there presenting what we have on the Beatles has sparked the need for the Beatles camp to put this propaganda out there. So we've had Peter Jackson's Get Back. There was eight days a week from Ron Hardy shortly before that. And it's all just hammering home this message of the Beatles being this phenomenal super group, as you say, capable of things that other groups seemingly weren't, just reinforcing that mythos. And there's just stories coming out virtually every week now. There was one a couple of days ago, which purported to be the first color photograph of the Beatles. I don't know if you saw that, but it supposedly came out of the archives of Mike McCartney, who's said to be Paul's brother. I don't believe he is, but it's a photograph of the Beatles from 1958 and they're rehearsing and they look very young. But I've seen that photograph before, but they're claiming it's just been unearthed. And it's the first colour photo of them. But anyway, the point being that there are stories coming out all the time now, just reinforcing this idea and trying to cement it into the consciousness of the public that the Beatles were this phenomenon. And uh, I just see a lot of that happening now. Yeah, they have to preserve the official narrative. I call it the Cinderella story. And we are seeing a lot of a lot of stuff coming out now to reinforce the myth. And, uh, and, and you know, and. By the way, John Lennon 
and uh, especially I think it was the the Rolling Stone magazine interview going back to the early 70s. It might have been 1971. He referred to the Beatles as a myth. He referred to McCartney as a myth. He referred to Dylan as a myth. You know, so, you know, John, uh, in his own way, uh, was communicating out the true story. But even back in the day when I read the article, I was reading all those interviews. I was a huge Beatle freak. Um, for some reason, it didn't sink in. Well, the reason is because it's the conditioning, right? You're conditioned to to kind of just cruise through that stuff and to embrace the the overall story that they've given us. But um, we're going to see more and more uh, information come out, more and more merchandise come out, Mark. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, entertainers, bands and such, celebrities come out and just talking up, Billy, talking up the Beatles because the Beatles are very important to the New World Order's, um, their agenda of a one world government, a one world religion. And uh, the Beatles... Uh, are at the, the, the front of the parade as far as uh, the music industry using music and entertainment as a re-engineering or a transformative tool uh, to be able to, you know, to alter the the, uh, the very fabric of our societies and our cultures. And the, like I said, the Beatles are at the front of the parade as far as I'm concerned. Right. If you accept that Paul is really Billy and we'll get into that, then there really is only one original Beatles member left. And it's not Ringo, because Ringo was brought in at a later stage. Right. It's Pete Best, the original drummer. So right. Pete's still alive at 81. He's out there somewhere. But unfortunately, he's not known for giving interviews. And he is the guy that probably knows more than anyone, apart from Billy, if you accept that's who he is, and possibly Ringo. Uh, that guy knows a thing or two. And sadly, it seems we're never going to discover it from him. No, I, I believe that all of them, all everybody that has been a player, the Beatles are a psychological operation. And I've said this many, many times, a creation of Tavistock. They were put in place in order to, uh, to uh, take people away from traditional values, to move uh, away from institutionalized religion, um, in particular, Christianity. Uh, in the memoirs of Billy Shears, it states that the Illuminati or the controllers, whatever you want to call them, declared war on Christianity back in on September 11th, 1962. So there, I don't think there's many Christians out there that would question that their religion, their faith has been under attack for a very long time. So, we, you know, we do have a proof point that that is in all likelihood true. Um, but everybody that's played a part it includes Pete Best, uh, his mother Mona Best, who had a child with uh, Neil Aspinall, who later became the chief executive of Apple. Um, they're all players, Mark. They're, I mean, they're all playing their part. So when people come out and say, "Oh, you know, well maybe Pete will spill the beans, or maybe Ringo will spill the beans," it's just wishful thinking. Nobody's going to spill the beans because they're all part. Of, of this psychological operation. They're, you know, they're playing their part. They're actors and performers. That's right. That's right. There's May Pang out there somewhere as well, but yeah. I don't suppose we can expect too much to come from her either. No, no. I, I was on an interview with, uh, 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 what was the guy's name? Anyway, I was on an interview with uh, with, with another host and uh, he brought up May Pang. And, and I guess he had May Pang on his show. And, um, he had said that uh, May uh, said that, you know, she uh, knew Billy uh, or uh, knew Paul and so on. And it, it's just, it was another convoluted type of explanation. And I, I explained to, uh, to, to Ed that, uh, you know, she, she's also a part of this. I mean, she, she used to work for Alan Klein. She was in Alan Klein's organization, you know? And so again, it's all interconnected. It's all integrated. And so if you do enough digging and looking into their backgrounds, you're going to see these connection points, right? And I'm not casting dispersions on anybody. I'm just saying that it's like, I know you know this because of all the work that you've done. When you look and you look deep enough, you start to see these, these connections. So, I mean, I think it's legitimate to question once you see these, uh, these connection points. 
That's right. I love, by the way, that you're out there in the United States and there's many other researchers out there digging into the Beatles and really paying attention to this British group. And I'm over here in the UK and I dig into Laurel Canyon and the counterculture scene of the 60s yeah. in the United States. It's like we're delving into each other's territories and trying to uncover the truth there. I just love that little quirk. So if Lennon and McCartney didn't write all the songs that they're credited with, and I would certainly agree with that statement, any clues as to where these songs came from? Because there's a popular opinion that these songs may have come from an individual named Theodore Adorno coming out of the Frankfurt School. And this claim came from John Coleman, the former British military intelligence guy in his book, The Committee of 300. I don't necessarily go for that theory, but it still leaves the question of where these songs may have come from and who may have really written them. Any further thoughts on that matter? Yeah, so we looked into, into Theodore Adorno, um, especially when I put out the big presentation back in April of 2020, did the Beatles write all their own music? Now, people like Adorno, Willis Harmon, they were all tied at Tavistock, Stanford Research Institute. They were social scientists, social engineers. And there was a claim out there that Adorno wrote all of the music. And uh, there was also another claim, um, and I could not find a source for this, but it's one that you know makes its way around the internet that the original copyrights and publishing belonged to Adorno on the early music. And we couldn't find any proof of that. So let me just, uh, I'll give you my, my overview. I do believe Theodore Adorno was involved. I believe he was working uh, hand in hand with George Martin. Adorno was the, the guy behind the scenes. Morton was the guy in front of the curtain. So I, I believe that they were working together. I believe it's possible that Adorno, who was an accomplished composer and songwriter, uh, may have written uh, some of the songs, as I believe that it's possible that George Martin was also uh, a possible candidate to have written some of the songs. In fact, I have a clip of him saying that he wrote the guitar piece to Michelle, he said that that was his composition, which contradicts Billy's story, which says that he was back in a France, a French cafe, and he would play that song and all that. It's just a nonsense story. But uh, but you know, George Martin in an interview said that you know the guitar piece in um, Michelle is his composition. Now that being said, what I have said is that uh, I do not subscribe to Adorno having written all of the music. I believe the way it worked was they had a uh, maybe uh, a handful of ghostwriters, songwriters on the on the EMI slash Tavistock staff that uh, that were furnishing the music, and uh, George Martin and Theodore Adorno were overseeing the process. So songs would come in, and uh, they would make a decision as to what songs would be included on the albums, and which songs would not. Um, I've been asked uh, to go along with this. I may as well answer this question too. Some people ask me, Mike, are you saying that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote none of the music between 1962 and 1966? And my answer has been, if they wrote songs, if they wrote songs. I, I highly suspect that they did not, but let's just say that they came in with a couple of songs every now and then, that those songs had to be presented to George Martin. And George Martin would have to decide whether he can do something with them. Um, I, I believe the way the process uh, may have worked is if let's just say Paul McCartney came in with something, biological Paul McCartney came in with a little tune. Um, he had to run it by George. And then George Martin, if he thought that the song had possibilities, would then hand the song off to a professional songwriter to make sure that it was constructed properly. It was ready for prime time and so on. But that is what I believe uh, could have possibly taken place if biological Paul McCartney and John Lennon were actually writing songs back during that period. Uh, I, I lean toward no. I don't believe that they wrote really any of the songs between 62 and 66. It changed starting in 1967 with the uh, the release of, uh, well, the making of, and then the release of Sgt. Pepper. Because uh, you can start to hear different musicianship. Um, you can hear, um, I hear more of, uh, 
original compositions by John and George in particular. Uh, the one I like to pick on is, uh, as a comparison, if you go to the White Album and you listen to the song Long, 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 and then you listen to the song Piggies, both songs are credited to George Harrison as the songwriter. But clearly, uh, both songs are not from the same songwriter. The person that wrote Piggies is not the same person that wrote Long, Long, Long. So, so from 1967 through 1970, even though Billy had John and George participate more in the songwriting process and play more on the recorded tracks, the Beatles, I've concluded based upon my research, was still using outside songwriters as an example, one that comes to mind that I'm, I'm almost certain was a contributing songwriter was Donovan. We're still using ghostwriters and uh, studio players during the Billy era, which was 67 to 1970, because during that period, Billy was running the show. From 62 to 66, it was George Martin running the show. And um, in my mind, George was clearly using ghost writers and, and studio players for the final product. So do you have any thoughts on John and Paul possibly being Freemasons or coming from a Freemasonic family where their fathers might have been Freemasons? Because this would be key to the question of why it was the Beatles over and above all other groups that were elevated to that position of fame and fortune and crucially influence. So I've long suspected that Paul and John may have been Freemasons, but I'm a bit lacking on evidence and proof there. Do we have any? Well, the proof I have put forth, I, uh, first of all, I, I do believe that they were Freemasons and um, otherwise they would not have been part of the, the psychological operation, right? So we know that with secret societies, they have their oaths and their oaths come before everything else. So they are bound by those oaths. And um, the, the proof that we have, Mark, at least the proof that I have presented is there are many pictures of the Beatles uh, with Masonic um, hand gestures, uh, the lion's paw, the hidden hand, um, the, the Masonic handshake, uh, plus, a, you know, just multitudes of images uh, of one-eyed symbolism and the such. Um, if we look at the Beatles' second album with the Beatles, that's all one-eyed symbolism. That's the black and white cover with half their faces shadowed out, you know. So that's all occulted, and uh, the Beatles as an entity are immersed in the occult. Uh, I'm not going to say that each of the Beatles, especially John, Paul, George, and Ringo, were occultists. They were young guys. I, be I believe they were young guys who were Freemasons, and uh, not necessarily 32nd and 33rd degree Masons. I, there are some people out there who, at first, some of these other some of these other researchers were saying that uh, I, I, they, they weren't Freemasons. They weren't Freemasons. And then, you know, I guess they watched some of my shows and I, my presentations and I would put forth the, the Masonic images, the, the, the handshakes and all that stuff. And then they said, okay, well, maybe they were Freemasons, but they were low level Masons. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, they were probably lower level Masons at the time because they were young guys, but that still means um, they are bound by their oaths. It doesn't mean because you're at a lower degree that you get a free pass, that you can walk off the reservation as far as what you're bound by when you take those oaths. So, um, yeah, so that's that's what I have put forth. And, and it's, again, this the Beatles were, were and still are a gigantic psychological operation. And whenever these types of operations are put together, you're not going to leave anything to chance. I mean, you're going to dot as many I's and cross as many T's as you possibly can to make sure that you... You keep it contained, you know, and so um, they're not going to take a chance that uh, somebody's going to go flap their lips and and talk about things. They can masterfully speak, which means they can talk in an encoded way. And if you understand that encoded way of speaking, you can pick up the truth. I, I've talked about this many times as well, and I've shown examples of it. Um, I mean, but they they George and John especially, especially as time went on. Um, and they, they they were dropping clues. I I, got, I talked about Lennon and the uh, the Rolling Stone magazine and, and other interviews that he's done where he talks about the myth. You know, I mean, how much clearer does it have to be? In my mind, yeah. Did I answer was your also, question? 
Yeah, there was okay. a single that was released by John Lennon's dad, Freddie. Freddie, yeah. Uh, he put out a song called uh, That's My Life. And the record sleeve is very interesting. I've shown this in some of my presentations. It's got the black and white checkerboard yeah. design on the, yeah. the sleeve right there. So that would appear to be another clue. Yeah, that and uh, one of the things that we've spoken about when I did the roundtables with uh, with uh, Sally and uh, Vicky and Wendy is that uh, there's very little information on their families when you go back and you take a look at it. So it's kind of interesting that the most famous pop rock songwriting team of all time, when you go to take a look at their family histories, you we don't have a lot of information. In fact, I found something very interesting the other day, and I don't know whether it's changed since I took a look at it. This goes back about a week ago. So somebody left a comment on my YouTube channel about Jim McCarty. Oh, Jim McCarty had a job. He used to do this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, that's not my recall. So... Um, I, I remember Jim McCartney really having the struggle as far as making a living and, and stuff like that. He had his challenges. So I went back into uh, taking a look at Wikipedia. And uh, when you take a look at Paul McCartney and they give his family background, this Jim McCartney's name is there's no longer a hot link. In other words, you can't click on it and then go to Jim McCartney and read about it. They just, you know, conveniently just didn't do that. They omitted it. And so I did a search on, uh, on, on the internet to see what I can find about Jim McCart, Jim McCarty. And I mean, I found some stuff, but again, it's the level at, at which it's presented seems really weird considering that he's the father of one of the most famous, if the, the, not the most famous pop rock musician of all time, Paul McCartney, right? So. I don't know. I, I know we talked about this and I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or my colleagues, but we talked about the lack of background on the family, any in-depth background. And then the, the hot link went away on Jim McCartney. If you look up Paul McCartney and I, like I said, this is going back about maybe about a week or two. I don't know whether it's, it's been fixed or I don't know, but the point being is that, uh, to me, the lack of in-depth content and information on their families is another red flag. See, when I did the, the big presentation back in April 2020, one of my first slides said that it, it's not one thing by itself, because one thing by itself can mean nothing. When you look at this conspiracy, it's... You have to take everything together. So you find something here and something here and something here and something there. And then you connect the dots. And then what happens is the bigger picture starts to emerge. But one thing by itself might not mean anything. And it's like, so if you look at the whole Jim McCartney thing, you know, you can take a look at it and say, okay, well, they don't have a lot of information on Paul McCartney's father. Well, I don't, I don't know. What does that really mean? And then when you dig deeper into the whole aspect of Tavistock and, uh, social engineering and psychological operations, then you start to think to yourself, well, you know, maybe this fits because, you know, maybe there's a reason why they don't have a lot of information on his father. What was his father's level of participation in kicking the whole thing off? The same thing with Freddie Lennon. There's really not a whole lot of information on Freddie either when you take a look at it. And again, people, see, people will write me and say, oh, no, hold on a second. I found something on him. I'm not talking about finding something on him. I'm talking about finding something that is is really conclusive or in depth, something that we can read and get some 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 history about that particular person. And you, know, you, you really we really don't have it. And uh, in memoirs, it tells us that uh, John actually was backed by an uncle, and uh, his uncle kind of signed off for him as far as the Beatles goes and, and, you know, getting the whole Beatle thing started. So I don't know who his uncle is though, but again, another mystery person in the equation. Right. I think we can also take this as indicative of the impact that we might be having as researchers, putting out this alternative information, which conflicts with the official narrative. If there's stuff getting scrubbed from the internet, or if it was never there in the first place, uh, it could be testament to that. We spoke earlier about Pete being replaced by Ringo as the drummer just before the Beatles found fame in 1962. 
Uh, one theory is that due to the embarrassment of Pete's mum, Mona, getting knocked up by Neil Aspinall, uh, they got rid of Pete because it was just a, a really embarrassing incident, you know. But do you think there was a specific reason why Ringo was brought in? Do you think Ringo was somebody that the Beatles controllers specifically wanted in place within that band at that time? Yeah, I, we don't really know for sure what the reasons were. Uh, we hear everything from, yeah, like you said, that Mona and Neil Aspinall having an affair and having a child, who, by the way, his name is Rogue, um, to Pete not being a great drummer, uh, to Pete being a drinker. I mean, these are all things that, you know, that are out there. Um, I believe it has more to do with the, the characters uh, that were established for each Beatle. Right. So we had uh, John Lennon as the, the witty, clever one. Paul's the cute Beatle. George is the quiet Beatle. And Ringo played the role of kind of like the underdog. He was the kind of the goofy type that, you know, he that's that's the the cast of characters that Tavistock wanted to create. And uh, perhaps Pete didn't fit that bill, but Ringo did. Uh Again, in the in the later editions of memoirs, it, in the most recent one, it also tells us in the footnotes that Ringo is his family is very well connected. Now, it doesn't say what that connection is. It, it just says that he comes from a very well connected background or family. But I, I tend to believe that uh, Ringo was put in place because of the the way they defined the characters. And he played a role. That's what I was saying before. They're all actors and performers. They're all playing a part. Like the monkeys, right? It's like the British monkeys. Exactly. I mean, why, you know, why was Davy Jones who Davy Jones was in the monkeys and Mickey Dolans and Mike Nesmith and Peter Tork, right? That's, you know, that's the character they played. And Ringo is playing a character. Um, and so that's why I believe he was chosen. Uh, another theory that was put forth in memoirs is that uh, Pete was a good looking guy back in the day and that uh, his good looks would compete with Paul McCartney, who was the, quote, cute beetle. And the controllers wanted to put the focus on Paul. He had his arched eyebrow, which is, uh, you know, which is symbolic of the, the, the eye of Ra, the eye of Horus, the all seeing eye. And they needed the attention to go toward Paul McCartney. And they didn't want anything taken away from it. They felt that Pete might do that because of being a good looking guy. So, I mean, I don't know about that. It's, I'm just explaining what is told to us in memoir. So I, I tend to lean more toward, I'm not saying that the, the occult aspect is not applicable. It is because like I said, they're an occulted entity, but I do believe it has something to do with, more to do with um, Ringo fitting the bill as far as uh, how they defined the character of the drummer within the Beatles. Sure. So just getting into this notion of Billy Shears, William Shepard replacing Paul McCartney, a lot of your presentations hang on the claims that are made by Thomas U. Harriet in the memoirs book, uh, memoirs books and the Billy's back books. Uh, if you Harriet were shown to be a fraud yeah, and if the memoirs books could be shown to be inaccurate, yeah, or some kind of controlled opposition, it would tend to blow the whole theory about Billy replacing Paul out of the water. Right. Uh, there's a lot riding on it. Yeah. So uh, it would be a very serious thing if it could be shown that uh, those books weren't all they were cracked up to be, wouldn't it? Yeah. So first thing is my, my research doesn't hinge on memoirs. Um, uh, what I've explained is memoirs was foundational from the perspective of I read the book back in 2016, and that led me on my course to pursue the uh, to, to uh, pursue the conspiracy. I mean, I knew about it years before, but I didn't pay much attention to it. As I've explained in other shows, um, I just thought it was a marketing ploy. It was a way to sell more records and all that stuff. So um, the premise that Billy replaced biological Paul McCartney is not coming from memoirs. I mean, memoirs, that's that's the case that he puts forth. But it's based upon my own analysis and looking at facial features and so on. 
Uh, it's very clear to me, just even if memoirs were not in the picture, it's based upon my own work, it's very clear to me that they are not the same person. They're just not. Billy has a longer face. He has different ears. You know, he has a higher forehead. I mean, you can go on and on. He's taller. And uh, so, I, I, yeah, I need to correct the record on that because that's an accusation that's made a lot. Um, when I read memoirs, I did not take it at face value. What I did was I said, okay, well, it's making this claim. And so I'm going to go off and go take a look and see if it's true. And if it wasn't true, I would say it's not true. Um, and that's how I've, I've approached it. Now, as far as if memoirs is not truthful. Now, the, the thing we have to re remember about memoirs is that it's a layered book. It's, it's a Masonic book. Okay. I'll just say it. It's written in layers. It's encoded. And so you have to break down the encoding. And, uh, one of the parts or one of the, the, um, the layers is you have to go outside of memoirs, like many of us who have used the book as a foundation to either prove or disprove what is being said in the book, right? So it leads you down into another road of research that is not actually contained in the book. As an example, my work on Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music is not specifically spelled out in the book. There's a very, very, very subtle hint in an earlier edition on page 350 and 351 that talks about George Martin taking their, their little songs and making them great, something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. Um, so I, you know, I took it outside. It, it wasn't until after my work that memoirs caught up and started talking about the fact that the Beatles did not write all their own music and there were ghost writers, but that was after I published my work. And I, you know, I actually had an exchange with Tom and he had said that he was able to do that because once the information becomes public, and I don't understand the logic behind it, to be honest with you, and why it's like this, but he said, then, then they have the ability to expand upon information that has been made public or put out into the public into the public arena, which was my presentation. So in any case, now for the folks that say if memoirs is, is proven um, to be fiction and a lie and all that stuff, my response is then prove it. This is the thing, right? People talk about it all the time. They want to say it's fiction, it's 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 a lie, it's 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 really interesting. Now they're saying it's Billy and he's lying. And these very same people going back a couple of years ago were saying that Billy was not behind the book. But now they're saying, OK, yeah, well, it is Billy behind the book. But now he's doing it because, you know, he wants to steer the, the, the conversation. He wants to steal the steer the narrative. Well, OK, but he's been doing that like forever. All right. The book just happens to be another vehicle in which he's doing that. But my response back to people, Mark who are going on and on about memoirs not being true and memoirs being fictional. Number one, again, it's encoded. Don't be lazy, break the encoding, and you'll understand that the book is truthful. Are there threads of fiction in it? Yes. And the reason is because Billy and Tom and others that are involved in the book are bound by non-disclosure agreements, by secret um, secrecy agreements, and they can't go down certain paths, okay? So, the 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 homework assignment for those that are constantly saying that type of thing is prove it, prove it, prove that the book is fiction. You know, it's just it's just cheap and lazy to go out there and just say it and then just drop it and walk away and then think, oh, oh I said it. So there you go. You have to prove it. And that was one of the uh, that was the main uh, premise of my last presentation. It's, you know, don't, don't believe stuff, know stuff. And if you want to know something, then you have to do the hard work and you have to go prove something. And, you know, what I have done over six years is to say that memoirs is a truthful book. I'm not saying it's all true, because like I said, it has to have threads of fiction contained within it. But it is overwhelmingly truthful when you do the work. I have said from the very beginning that when Billy goes out, he's going to go out with a ticker tape parade. There was going to be this huge buildup as he rides off into the sunset. And what has happened? It's exactly what's taking place. All of we, see, we spoke about it earlier on in this conversation. All of this 
this stuff is going on. It's building up Billy. It's building up the Beatles. That's riding into the sunset. That's the ticker tape parade that I've been talking about. You know, um, a lot of people who say that the book is fiction, it's because they don't want to believe the book is true, period. Because if they believe the book is true, then they have to, then they have to admit that, you know, they get sucker punched in a way that, um, that this, that what they believed about the Beatles is not the truth, that it is a Cinderella story. It is a fictional narrative or huge chunks of it are fictional. They would have to own up to that. And, you know, many people don't want to be put in that position. They don't want to have to admit that they were, they were wrong. You know, Hey, look, I, I was in that position. I believed that the, the Beatles official narrative, I believed all these fantastical stories. I thought they were geniuses and magical and brilliant and all that stuff. And I had to swallow glass too. I had to sit there and go, holy shit. You know, it's like, well, you know, what was I believing? Well, in? we've all been there one way I know or we've all, we, we, we've all been there. It doesn't, it's not just the Beatles. It's anything, right? Any, pick any major conspiracy. So that's my take on it for those, for those folks. And if you're watching this and I'm sure you are, then you need to go prove it. And, you know, and you don't prove it by going after and attacking me. This is what they like to do because the cat is already out of the bag, right? The ship has sailed. It's out there. The way you prove something is to roll your sleeves up, put your head down, do the hard work and do the hard research. That's what you do. It's not research to go attack somebody. That That's not research, right? That's just a clown show that you're putting on. So anyway, I hope I answered your question. Yep. <laughs> Well, I get this all the time. People want to attack work that you put out there and it requires no imagination, no creative input no. to just attack what somebody has done. What does require creativity is going out there and doing your own research, presenting your own information. And I pose this question to people that attack me in my work. I say, please point me to where I can find your unique individual research which presents to the world points which nobody else has put out there and right. contradicts what I'm saying. And the answer, of course, is always the same, which is complete silence. It's crickets. I okay. do the same thing, Mark, the exact same thing. People will say, well, they go on and on. I'm like, hey, you know what? Point me to your work. I would be more than happy to go to your website or your YouTube channel or your book or whatever it is you have out there that presents your case. And it, crickets. It's nothing. It's the, the, the problem is that Many people are just stuck in the conditioning. There are so many people, even in the quote truth community, which is really a perspective community, that just want a tree hug. They want to hold on to what it is they want to believe, not what they know. It's what they want to believe, and we have to step away from that. If we ever expect to turn this ship around, I'm talking about the world and what's going on. We have to stop having idol worship. We have to stop worshiping musicians, bands, entertainers, celebrities, politicians, uh, Silicon Valley icons. We have, to, we have to stop doing that. Because when, when people do that, you're giving up your power, you're giving up your authority, and you're placing somebody else in the authority role. And it's not you, you know? In any case, I don't want to go on and on here, waste too much time. I know we're limited. You got your mute. You're on mute, Mark. All right, let me unmute. Okay. How many people in the music business do you think would have been clued in on Paul really being Billy? Do you think you only get to know that when you reach a certain level in the industry? Would it only be people of Paul or Billy's generation, like Mick Jagger and Donovan and uh, uh, Denny Lane and people like that? Or do you think there are those in the current generation of musicians who, when they reach a certain level, get taken in and, and the secret is revealed to them. And obviously they take an oath whereby they won't divulge it. But do you think it is common knowledge within the music industry's high rollers? Yes, I do. I, I think that within, within the, you know, the, the inner circle where there's the decision makers, where the power resides and, and there are players that are uh, musicians and artists and stuff like that, that are plugged into that. Like, like Denny Lane as an example, we'll use Denny, right? Um, they know, they know. Um, then outside of that, what happens is uh, they might have suspicions or they, they may not know, but let's just say they have suspicions. Uh, 
they are bound by, again, their oaths as Freemasons and, you know, whatever other secret society that, that they're in, they're not going to say anything. Uh, and then there the reaches a point where, um, as you move further and further away from the center of the operation, when you move out, um, I don't think they care. I talk about they, the controllers care about who says what, because at that point they could just chalk them up as crazies, right? This is typical how MK Ultra works, right? If somebody breaks their MK Ultra programming and they start talking about, start talking about the programming, the controllers really don't worry so much about that for most of these people, because when they start telling their stories, they sound so crazy that they know that the, you know, the profane masses are just going to look at them and say, oh, you're, you're crazy. So I, what I'm saying is, you know, there's kind of this hub in the middle and they all know, obviously. And then as it expands out, you're going to have people that still know. Um, these might be other musicians and people that have worked with Billy in the past. And then as you spread out further and further out, then they may or may not know. And then it gets to a point where the controllers don't care because if they open their mouth, nobody's going to listen to them anyway. I you think Stevie current, Wonder and Michael Jackson would have known who they were really working with. I don't know. Um, I think that it's possible. I, I, you can't really say for sure, you know. Um, some would say that, you know, Michael Jackson was swapped out. You know? <laughs> so, right, we hear that one. Uh, as an example, a person that I think that does know is Dave Grohl. Okay, I believe Grohl is well aware that Billy is Billy and he's not Paul McCartney. That guy um, is high level connected for sure. Yes, yes, he is. And that's the thing, right? So it has to do with connections. Um, and, you know, in, in show business, that's how they look at it, by the way, too, right? It's just entertainment and show business. And even though to us, it seems unbelievable that they would pull a stunt like this, right? Because it is, it's a lie and it is a deception. That's another thing. People think that, you know, I love Billy. I don't love Billy, folks. I mean, he is a person of interest that I like to research because when I research him, I get to understand the bigger picture much more. You know, I, there are plenty of times I have said things that weren't flattering about Billy. All right. I just want to clear that up as well. So I, it is, it's, it's, um, it's degrees, Mark. Uh, how many degrees are you separated from the center? And your point, it's the connections. How connected are people? Uh, but there are people that don't know. I mean, I know I have sources of mine that are in the music business. I have uh, uh, two sources that actually worked with Billy, one going back into the uh, early 1970s. And uh, Billy actually uh, played bass on, uh, on this person's album i don't know if it was all the songs maybe a couple of songs and at the time he had no idea that that billy wasn't paul mccartney it wasn't until much later on he stumbled onto my work that he figured out that oh my god you know that guy wasn't paul mccartney it was it was billy so you know like i said it has to do with how far away you are from the center of the operation and how well connected you are if you're well connected and you probably know if you're not well connected then you probably don't know and you won't say anything because if you say anything, you you run the risk of losing your career. I've, I've had, I have a, a person, a, a source of mine who is a professional sound engineer has been in the business for decades. And I've asked him, I said, you know, would you mind coming on the show and talking a little bit about how the whole engineering process works? And he explained a lot of stuff to me, how records are produced and, uh, um, post-production on uh, live performances to, to enhance them, all of this stuff. And I wanted him to come on the show. And he said to me, Mike, I can't do it. He says, because if I do it and I'm connected into this, he says, I, I, I can lose my career. I'll just be blackballed and, and that'll be that. So we have, to re we have to remember that there are people that are in that position as well. They just cannot open their mouth. Oh, oh, and would that be the first time that's ever happened? Take a look at all the doctors that tried to say something about uh, what took started taking place in March of 2022. Uh, it was March of 2020. I don't want to say it here in case you want to put this on YouTube. But, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, um, what happened to them? They were vilified. And uh, they were marginalized. So don't think that 
that type of uh, reaction or those repercussions don't exist because they do. And people have to have a livelihood and they have to make money. And so they keep their mouth zipped up even when they know the truth. It happens all the time. That's right. How high level connected do you think Brian Epstein would have been? Do you think he was a manipulated stooge to some degree and was getting played by the Beatles' real controllers? Or do you think he was quite a high level guy? And also, uh, he checked out quite early at the age of 32 in August of 67, very suddenly, straight after Sergeant Pepper, right in the middle of the summer of love. That's always struck me as a bit suspicious. So any further thoughts on Brian? I think Brian was, um, he was either a 32nd or 33rd degree Mason, if I had to guess. Um, I don't, I don't sense he had the full story. I think he probably had like a middle management understanding of it all. Uh, I believe his job was, was very defined and very focused, which was to, you know, manage the band. Um, and, kind of bring them along. And that's, that's what I think his role is. And uh, yeah. And, and I, I do lean toward him being taken out. You know, Brian had some proclivities that uh, could have been a problem as, as far as uh, if the, the news had gotten out, you know, his inclination to the same sex and, uh, and alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. So I think it's possible that, at that point, uh, they determined that his services were no longer required or needed. And so, you know, he was uh, he was taken out. I mean, I, I believe that's a possibility. Can't say anything for sure, but that's what I think. But I don't think that he was in the know in the know. He knew enough. He was given enough information to move it along, but he wasn't given the full story. It's the same with the Beatles, by the way, the original Beatles. And Billy knows everything, but John, Paul, George, and Ringo they didn't know all the ins and outs. They were given enough information to uh, to chug along and do what they needed to do. And that's how it works. It's a need to know. You know they don't spill the beans. They don't, they don't take the entire psychological operation, the entire mission and say, okay, well, we're, gonna, we're going to explain it to as many people as we possibly can. No, they <laughs> explain it to as few people as they possibly can in, in order to contain it and make sure that, you know, they can pull it off. That goes back to a comment that I made earlier about how few people still alive today would have inside knowledge of the Beatles PSYOP. Uh, with every passing year, there are fewer and fewer and fewer. And, right. you know, the, the point is going to come where there'll be nobody left alive that was part of that inner circle. And it'll be the job of us researchers to kind of look in from the outside and try and piece it all together. Right. But there's really not many of them left now. Nope. And... Um... That's also mentioned in memoirs. Billy tells us that uh, a, a lot of the folks that were involved in the early days with the surgeries and the fillers and all that stuff, they're gone. They're dead. So, uh, yeah, and it's getting to the point where, you know, he's probably one of the only people left <laughs> that knows the entire story. You know, I'm sure maybe there are a couple of others, but uh, he's the one that, you know, is in the public eye that knows. But yeah, it's, it's been a long time, Mark, and it's, been 56 years since the, uh, the the death or replacement of Paul McCartney. You know, I know some people believe he didn't die. And, you know, he's just swapped out. But we'll just put it this way. It's been 56 years since, at least in my mind, um, we have seen or heard of a, a biological pull. That's a long time, 56 years. You know, and it's, it's 60 years since the Beatles were, were created, 1962. So... Uh, for some people, that's an entire lifetime. There are people that don't even live to 60 years old. So I also mentioned earlier Mike McCartney or Mike McGear, who is supposed to be Paul's brother, looks nothing like him. I suspect him of being an actor that was hired to play the role. But he emerged recently as apparently having unearthed this original photo of the Beatles, the first colour photo. So the point is that he's being kept in the spotlight and his identity is being kept alive, you know, some 50 odd years after he first emerged in the public eye. And it just reinforces this notion of a lifetime actor's work never being done. So once you're beholden to the controllers of the industry, they could call on you at any time. 
to reinforce some agenda that they need to prop up. And we've seen this over the course of the last three years with so many celebrities having been hired to reinforce the official narrative of what's been going on. You know, Paul himself has played a big role in this, or Billy, uh, Mick Jagger, Elton John. They're all getting wheeled out and they've wheeled out Mike McCartney, Mike McGear again recently. So it seems a lifetime actor's work is never done. They can call on you anytime they want. Yeah. So and, and I don't know whether Mike McCartney is Paul's biological brother or not. Um, I have also said that he doesn't look anything like his brother. But the problem with that is that I know other families where siblings don't resemble each other. So, I, I mean, I kind of just kept neutral on that. Um, it hasn't been a main focus of mine. But your point, uh, Mark, of being a lifetime actor, whether he is biological Paul's biological brother or not, is I don't want to say it's irrelevant, but um, the, the larger point is that, yes, he has a lifetime role. And yes, so and what happens is when they need you, and they call on you, you need to be there and you need to do what it is that they are telling you, not asking you, they're telling you to do. We see this all the time. You know, it's like when um, the whole thing with uh, the March 2020 event and how many of them came out and said, you know, wear a face covering and go get the, you know, that was because they were rolled out as celebrities, as influences, you know, influences within society to go push the agenda. And that's what they do. They push agendas. That's what they're there for. That's right. And there were just no dissenting voices. That's how you can know that it was all a psyop because every celebrity, every public figure was all singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, uh, except Clapton and Van Morrison, maybe. And, and they and Clapton especially, because when he came out and talked about what happened to him after he took the uh the jab, he was well, he, he ridiculed did. and vilified. That's right. But I was very disappointed to see Eric uh, doing a concert just the other week where he was paying tribute to the Queen, recently yeah. deceased or not, depending on how you feel about it. But um, he was doing God Save the Queen in one of his concerts. Yeah. And it just made me think, well, if you're capable of doing research, which tells you that the V word is not everything it's cracked up to be, you're capable of doing research into the true nature of the royals and what the monarchy represents, what the British Empire represents. You know what I mean? I mean, another yeah. example would be Roger Waters of Pink Floyd, who's often put out there as some kind of truth a hero and he's on the side of the people and all this. And certainly Roger said a lot of very relevant things, particularly when it comes to a certain Middle Eastern state and its relationships with its neighbour just over the wall there. Yeah. Uh, he's had a thing or two to say about that political regime. But Roger also came out and praised Bill Gates as a great guy and Anthony Fauci as a wonderful guy of our times. And again, somebody capable of doing the level of research that he has into these other issues is capable of getting to the bottom of what this whole agenda has really been about. And it just reinforces to me the fact that you can't trust a single damn one of them. If they're no. celebrities, if they're famous, they're all pushing agendas. Otherwise, they just wouldn't have had those careers. No, no. And they're obviously in the club, both of them, Roger and Eric, if you ask me my opinion. And uh, I think every once in a while, we can call it controlled opposition. Or every once in a while, they step out and they say something that's truthful. And then they get reined in. They get pulled back in. Um, I think with some of them, Mark, and I'm not talking about either Eric or, or Roger, uh, I think that their thought process and their thinking can be compartmentalized. In other words, they realize this little small sliver of something and they talk about it, but they don't expand or extend out their thinking into other areas. They don't realize that it's all interconnected. They, they, they look at it as uh, like silos. Everything is vertical and it's not connected. Yeah, there's no there's context no, to it. There's no context to it. So I, I think that that's a possibility as well. Because um, I, I do have uh, Eric's interview up when he, he talks about how he was he was damaged and injured. It seemed very sincere to me. 
and uh, he lost uh, feeling neurologically in his in his hands and was concerned that he might not be able to play guitar again. Uh, when he came out and did that, he spoke about it. They they came down and say they, I'm talking about the controlling matrix, the media and all that stuff. They came down on him like a ton of bricks, like they dropped a piano on his head. So uh, in that interview, he had said that the phone calls uh, for him to record or go on tour or whatever, just dried up. It just evaporated. So, you know, it's possible that, you know, afterwards, Eric was reminded about where his allegiance is and uh, what it is he needs to do. And now he needs to make amends. So don't ever talk about that stuff again and uh, get up here and, and, you know, praise the queen. It's possible. It certainly is. Do you feel there are more musicians and celebrities and public figures than we would ever know who yearn to be able to get up there and speak the truth and tell what they know, but they realize that if they did so at the best, their career would come to a grinding halt or at worst something much more serious might happen to them do you think there are those whose consciences keep them awake at night uh, down to the stuff that they know and the fact that they're not able to communicate it widely yeah i think there are those out there that have those thoughts but there are also those out there that don't give it a thought at all so uh, it goes back to what i was saying before how close are you to the hub or the center? So if you have been very uh, well accommodated as far as money, fame, fortune, and all that stuff, and that's the world you operate in, then in all likelihood, you have completely bought into the agenda. So if we look at somebody like Elton John, as an example, I, don't, I mean, again, it's just my opinion. I don't think he's losing any sleep over what's going on in the world because Elton is, you know, he's been very well rewarded for his role. Okay. So I think there are those types that don't lose any sleep over it. And then there are those that, that do. And I tend to believe that those that do lose some sleep over it are those that um, were brought into the system. So the way it works is the, um, Freemasonry is a corporate structure. It's just like any corporation. And so at the top, you know, you have the, the chairman, the chairwoman, and then it just pyramids down like this. And uh, and they're always on the lookout for resources and skills that can help them to move their agenda forward. Now, there are those that are bloodlined and they are born and bred into the system. I think those people probably don't lose a lot of sleep because that's the only world that they have known. But there are also people that were not born and bred into the system and they are brought in because they are useful uh, tools or they have useful skills or the the controllers have determined that they can make something out of it. They can, you know, it's like a lot of these pop tarts, right? Like the Britney Spears and those types there where they are brought in and they are shaped and molded to, to play a certain role um, in order to steer people in a certain direction and move the agenda forward. I believe those people that are further from the center and are kind of brought in, they, they have the allure of fame and fortune, signing record contracts, doing tours and stuff like that. Once they figure out what's going on, then I think that they are more apt to say, hey, you know something? Um, this is not good, okay? This is not all it's buffed up to be. And there's a lot of really shady, dark stuff going on. Some of them might open their mouth and others, you know, they know what's going on, but they won't say anything. They'll just, you know, again, because they're afraid of losing a career or two, something bad could happen to them. And bad things do happen to them. So, you know, it's not like, it's not like the people at the top of the uh, of the pyramid are, you know, have humanity in their hearts. <laughs> you know? That's right. Yeah. I'm not sure they can even accurately be described as people uh, right. when they don't have their full uh, capacities of humanity intact. No, exactly. Uh, I, in the, in the show you did recently, you mentioned about how you believe that there were unseen forces at play, that it, it just can't all be driven by 
humans, right? And I've, I've said that for a long time. There is the, the whole occulted aspect of this thing. It, it does. There's an interaction. There's a connection into unseen forces or the unseen world. And uh, I, I do believe that that's in place. And uh, it's at the very top of the pyramid. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that these individuals that run things are shape-shifting reptilians or anything like that, but just that when you don't have empathy, when you don't have compassion, can you accurately be descri described as 100% human? Because you're lacking an essential part of what it is to be a human. Right. Anyway, just circling back round to the main crux of our conversation, which is the Beatles as a psyop. If we accept that they are, that they were, what does that tell us about other aspects of life, human society? What lessons can we take from this? Because it goes beyond just the music industry. It goes beyond the Beatles just being a pop group. It goes much, much further. So what would you say are the lessons that people can take away from this kind of knowledge? That the reality that we're interacting with is an illusion from beginning to end. And the Beatles... It's, it's a huge psychological operation. Um, the components contained within it are applicable to so many other conspiracy, conspiracies. You know, we have the Pyramid of Power. We have secret societies, which Freemasonry, the Illuminati. We've got Tavistock, which has to do with uh, mind control and social engineering. Um, it's about the drug culture. It's about uh, the occult, uh, including Aleister Crowley. A lot of people think that Crowley was just a carnival barker, but he, you know, he wasn't. He was very, very influential in, in the structure that's in place today, especially his religion of Thelema. Thelema is Luciferianism, okay? So when people say that Luciferianism doesn't have like a holy book or any kind of doctrine, I would argue that it does. It, it comes through in Thelema. And, you know, we have magic, mysticism, we have rituals, you know, Luciferianism, Satanism, and so on. So, I mean, all of this stuff is embedded in the Beatles conspiracy. And all of this stuff is embedded in many of these other conspiracies, these very prominent conspiracies, conspiracies that have taken place or are currently underway. So the takeaway is, is to understand that you are being deceived and lied to on a daily basis, that your thoughts in all likelihood are probably not your own if you buy into and uh, you embrace the reality that's all around you. So if you embrace it and you believe that this is real and you believe that this is the way it's supposed to work, then you need to wake up. And to the degree, Mark, that people don't understand it and they don't decode it and break it down and understand that they are that there are lies and deception all around us, then we're going to continue to struggle. It's going to make your job and my job and many other people who are trying to wake people up difficult. And in fact, I've gotten to the point where I look at it as an individual journey. And what I mean by that is the work that I do is work that I do for me, myself as an individual, as a soul, to understand what this is all about. And so your job one or the first priority is for me to wake up and it's for me to understand how all this works. And if my information helps others to wake up, that's great. But I learned a long time ago that it's it's very difficult. I, almost, I would say maybe it's even impossible to have some kind of mass awakening. You know, so I, I really do believe it's an individual journey, and it comes it comes down to that. Um, I know a lot of people cringe when I say that because they want this mass awakening to take place. But you know, I go back to March of twenty twenty, and I've mentioned it a number of times in this show, and. At the time when they first announced, you know, CVID and wearing face coverings, I never in my wildest dreams at that point in time when I was doing the work did I think that 98% like, of the population across the world was going to fall in line and and do what they were told. Yep, me as neither. ludicrous as it was, I know I didn't. Ne want. Never would have imagined it, even after no. all the research that we've done. We know how mind control works and propaganda, but I never would have imagined it. No, the same way. And you know, even today, I mean, it's it's the amount of information that's come out about it, as far as the 
I have to be very careful here, folks. I don't want the show to get bounced. I would like to put this on YouTube because it's a much broader audience. But uh, you know, getting the the injections, right? The uh, the of, yeah, the yeah, the amount of information that's come out about what that is all about and how it is very dangerous. Um, still, um, there are people that don't know anything about that information, or if they do hear it, it's as if they um, they just don't listen to it. They disregard it. It's like there's filters that have been put into their brains that filter out anything that cuts across the grain or contradicts the official narratives. And they just, they just shove it off to the side and they don't want to hear it, you know? So I don't know. That's why I look at that situation. It's still going on. I mean, I, I know people that are still getting shots and still taking boosters. And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, like, how do you not know what's going on here at this point in time? We're over two years into this thing. And is still playing along. I don't get it. So, I mean, to me, it's an individual journey. And if my work, like I said, it's for me first and foremost. And if I'm able to help people wake up by putting my information out or what it is I've researched and what it is I'm, I found out, then great. If it doesn't, I don't know what to do about it because I can't really do any more than what I'm already doing. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So we'll close out in a minute, Mike, and I do want to try and end on a vaguely positive note and not a doomy one. Uh, I just want to recite a lyric, first of all, from a song by Jefferson Airplane, where Grace Slick sings on Somebody to Love. When the truth is found to be lies and all the joy within you dies. And a lot of people say to me that when they discover that the Beatles weren't who they thought they were or none of these entertainment uh, entertainers, the pop music industry generally is not all about fun and fluffy entertainment. It's very dark in many cases. It strips away the joy and the fulfillment that they used to get from listening to these artists. But I've found that through researching this stuff and discovering the truth of who, who these people really are, it's empowering. And I think the takeaway from it, if there is any positivity to be found, is the fact that we've now been able to cut through all the lies and all the deception. We're no longer mugs. We're no longer dupes. We know better. We're smarter than that. So we have to embrace the empowerment that this knowledge brings, because that's about the only positive thing there is in it. But that empowerment is positive. It helps us to evolve spiritually. and. Uh, it's, it's generally a good thing that we can take away from this. So that's kind of my parting thought, but I'd be interested in yours. Yeah, I tell people that all the time, Mark. Knowing the truth is empowering because number one, it allows you to avoid the traps. So you have to know that whenever you walk out in this reality, you're stepping into a minefield. It can blow up at any time. Something could happen, right? Don't you want to know where the mines are? Don't you want to at least have an idea of where a mind might be, you know? So um, that's how, that's my analogy. And I found it extremely empowering because people will ask me, oh, you know, does this bother you? Is it too dark for you? I mean, do you get pessimistic? And I'm like, no, not, I don't. I really don't. I'm very, opt I'm a very optimistic person. I look at my, my family first. My, my, my first grandchild was born. We, we talked about this before we started the show back last month. So there's a lot of beautiful, positive things in this world. And that's where we should be spending most of our time. We didn't come into this world to be have our heads submerged in the, the murky waters of what the controllers have put together. But knowing the truth and understanding what their game is, what the schemes are, what their gimmicks are, what, you know, what their tactics and their tools are, is a great thing. Because to be honest with you, Mark, with everything that goes on in the world, I don't have any fear. I, I just don't have any fear. I live my life every day as positive as I possibly can. I try to bring in as much good and love into my life as I can. And uh, I look at this, this incarnation, my coming into this world at this point in time as a gigantic lesson. It's like being in an education of, of, of higher learning and getting, getting to peek behind the curtain and seeing the great Oz and how it operates and how it works. So I agree with you. It's very, very empowering. And uh, does it get frustrating sometimes? Yes, it does get frustrating. I'm not gonna say that it's not frustrating, 
It is, but I try to limit the level of frustration and I, I really try to major in, in good stuff in my life. Sure. That's beautiful. And I feel that we are quite privileged, our generation, I've said this many times, to be able to uh, have these comprehensions now of how the game is played because no generation before us has stood a chance of being able to uncover uncover this information to the degree that we have. So we have to look upon that as a privilege that uh, has been afforded to us, I feel. So just remind people where they can go to find your work, Mike, and also what have you got coming up? Any projects on the horizon that you, you want to shout out there? Well, to, uh, to take a look at my work, just go to my hub website, Sage of Quay, S-A-G-E-O-F-Q-U-A-Y, sageofquay.com. All of my links are there. It's very simple. It's one-stop shop. And uh, as far as things that I'm working on, I am uh, finishing up um, the songs for a third album, which I'm looking to release in the early part of next year. Um, I've got two presentations coming out this year. Uh, one is going to be Billy's connection into the mythological character of Pan. And that's going to be uh, the work of actually a colleague of mine, Sally. She's done amazing, an amazing job of pulling that together. So we're hoping to have that out within the next, I would say, 30 to 60 days. And I also have a uh, another presentation that's about 90% done, but it's going to come after the pan presentation because I want to get Sally's work out that has to do with the esoteric passages within memoirs. Um, and other than that, I think for the rest of the year, that's probably going to be about it as far as major presentations go, big presentations on that are Beatles related. There might be some smaller stuff here or there, but uh, but the big thing really uh, when we talk about positive stuff is to get the album out. <laughs> so um, I've got uh, one more song to uh, to write and record and I'll have the 10 for the album and then I'll be able to release it. Sure. All right, Mike, thanks for coming on today. Good to reconnect with you again after all this time. All right, Mark. Thank you so much.